Welcome back to AI Paper Podcasts. Okay, if you're just joining us for the quick version, here's the absolute core insight from the paper we're covering today. Absolute zero. Reinforce self-play reasoning with zero data. Yeah, the big takeaway is this new paradigm, absolute zero. Right, and it lets researchers train these really powerful reasoning models, think math and coding, without needing any human-labeled data. Which is pretty radical. Mm. The model basically proposes tasks for itself, solves them, and learns from feedback it can verify, all in this self-play loop. And get this, it actually hits state-of-the-art in coding. Beating models trained on carefully curated human data sets. That's the nutshell. Uh-huh. Pretty impressive stuff. Okay, so for everyone staying for the deep dive, let's unpack why this is such a significant step. I mean, traditionally, training AI to reason has involved these huge human-generated data sets, right? Exactly. Supervised fine-tuning, reinforcement learning, they all lean heavily on examples or feedback mechanisms defined by humans. And the effort involved in creating and maintaining those data sets, especially as models get more complex, well, it's massive. It's a real bottleneck. Mm -hmm. And it raises that question. Are we limiting AI by only feeding it problems we think of solve the way we solve them? Which is where absolute zero comes in as a completely different approach. Absolutely. The, uh, the really novel part is the model learns to be both the student and the teacher. It creates its own curriculum, essentially. Within this closed loop, you said, with verifiable feedback. That's the key. Yeah. An environment that can definitively say, yes, that solution is correct, or no, it's not, without needing a human answer key. It completely cuts out the need for external human annotation for the reasoning part. So we're talking about models learning to reason without us explicitly showing them how, step by step. Pretty much. It learns through its own experience. And the paper mentions these two roles, right? Proposer and solver. Figure three has a diagram, I think. Yeah, figure three shows the loop nicely. The model acts as a proposer, thinking up tasks, and then switches hats to be the solver, tackling those same tasks. It's this continuous cycle. Propose, solve, get feedback, learn. Okay, cool. So before we really get into the weeds of absolute zero, maybe let's quickly touch on those traditional methods and their limitations again. SFT, you mentioned. Sure. Supervised fine tuning, SFT. It's basically learning by imitation. Mm -hmm. You feed the model lots of examples like a math problem, the step-by-step -step human reasoning to solve it, and the final answer. Chain of thought examples, often. Right, and the model learns to predict that whole sequence. The goal is just to mimic the expert demonstrations as closely as possible. But the limitation is obvious. You need tons of those high-quality human-generated demonstrations. Exactly. Scalability is the issue. Mm -hmm. And the quality and diversity of the data limit the model's potential. Okay, and the other one was RLVR, reinforcement learning with verifiable rewards. Yeah, RLVR. It's a bit different. It focuses more on the outcome. The model tries to solve a problem, produces an answer, and then gets a reward if the answer is correct. So less focus on the how and more on the what. Kind of. It learns through trial and error, optimizing for strategies that lead to correct answers. But uh, it still needs that set of problems and, crucially, a reliable way to verify if the answer is right, often based on human-defined gold answers or verifiers. So bottom line, both SFT and RLVR, for all their strengths, are still fundamentally tied to human-curated data in some form. Problems, solutions, verification methods. Correct. They depend on us providing the learning material or the grading rubric. And Absolute Zero is designed to break that dependency. Precisely. It lets the model generate its own problems, solve them, and learn from objective feedback from an environment, like a code interpreter. It's self-contained learning through self-play. Okay, let's get into that Absolute Zero engine then. How does one model manage both proposing and solving? It uses a single language model, Po, which is pretty standard these days. But during training, parts of its computation are directed towards proposing, they call this proposed day, and parts towards solving, solve day. So it's leveraging the model's ability to both understand and generate text, but for different roles in the loop. Exactly, it's quite an elegant use of the model's capabilities. All right, walk us through that loop again, step by step, maybe thinking about that figure three diagram. Okay, so first the agent in its proposer role, propose, generates a task. Mm. This proposal can be guided maybe by telling it generate a coding task or generate a deduction task. That's the conditioning variable Z. So it has some control over what kind of problems it creates. Yeah, some steering. Then this proposed task goes to the environment E. The environment, maybe with the transformation function F, checks if the task is valid and turns it into a solvable problem. A query X and a ground truth answer E. Ah, so the environment figures out the right answer automatically, like running code. Exactly. 
per code it could execute the program. And importantly, the proposer gets a reward here, or propose, based on how learnable the environment thinks that task is. Interesting. So the proposer is encouraged to make good tasks, not just any task. Right. Then the same model puts on its solver hat, solve. It gets the query X and tries to produce an answer Y. And the environment checks that answer Y against the gold answer Y. Correct. And based on that comparison, the solver gets its reward for solve. Maybe a plus one if it's right, a zero if it's wrong, or something more nuanced. And both the proposer and solver update based on these rewards, learning together. Jointly trained, yeah. The whole cycle repeats constantly generating tasks, attempting solutions, and refining both proposing and solving skills based on the feedback. Okay, let's zoom in on the proposer. How does it know what kind of tasks to create? You mentioned conditioning on task type, but also past examples. Yes. So when proposing, say, a deduction task, it's not just told, make a deduction task. It's also shown a few examples, pay examples, of deduction tasks it's successfully created before, which are stored in a buffer. Like a memory of its past work. Kind of. But the prompt explicitly tells it to generate something different from those examples. Ah, to encourage diversity, so it doesn't just keep making the same easy problem over and over. Exactly. You need variety to learn robustly. That diversity mechanism is pretty crucial for exploring the problem space. Makes total sense. And you mentioned the environment filters and transforms these proposals. What does that look like in practice? It's like quality control. If the task involves code, the environment runs it in a safe sandbox. Does mm -hmm. it crash? Does it have syntax errors? Does it even return anything? So it weeds out the nonsense tasks. Right. It ensures the solver gets well-defined, potentially solvable problems. It's a vital step. We talked about rewards. The solver rewards seem simple, right or wrong, but the proposer reward is more about learning potential. Yeah, it's trickier. You don't want tasks that are too easy because the model doesn't learn much, but you also don't want tasks that are impossibly hard. The Goldilocks zone of difficulty. Exactly. The proposer reward tries to incentivize tasks that are challenging but achievable, pushing the solver to improve. It's about finding that sweet spot for efficient learning. Okay, let's make this more concrete. The paper uses deduction as an example task type. How does that work in this loop? So for deduction predicting a program's output given the program and an input, the proposer's job is to generate both the program P and an input I. Conditioned on past deduction examples, like you said. Right. Then the environment executes that program P with input I to get the actual output O. This PIO triplet, if it runs okay, gets stored in the deduction buffer. Okay, so the proposer makes the mini exercise. What does the solver do? The solver gets the program P and the input I, but not the output. Its task is to predict the output. Let's call it O. And the environment checks if O matches the actual output O. Yep. Using, as the paper notes, type aware value equality in Python. So it's not just string matching. Mm -hmm. It checks if, say, two sets contain the same elements, even if the order is different. Smart. Handles nuances in code output. And the other tasks, abduction and induction, quick overview. Sure. Abduction is kind of the reverse. Mm. Given the program P and the output O, predict the input I that would produce it. Often needs some backward reasoning or trial and error. Yeah. And induction is maybe the most complex. Yeah. Given some input-output pairs, I1, I2, O2, et cetera, and maybe a description, the solver has to infer the program P that fits those examples. Wow, so it's actually learning to write programs based on examples. Exactly. It covers a good range of reasoning skills, forward prediction, backward reasoning, and program synthesis. So how does this whole thing start? Does it just begin proposing randomly? You mentioned a seed set. Right. It needs a little kickstart. They generate an initial small set of valid program input output triplets using the base LLM before the main absolute zero training starts. So preceding the buffers. Exactly. The very first proposals are prompted using examples from this seed set. And if a buffer is totally empty initially, they're even a fallback, like a super simple identity function example just to get the ball rolling. A tiny push. Okay, now, safety. If the model is writing and running code, how do they stop it from doing something bad? The mm -hmm. validation procedure. Super important. They have several checks. First, program integrity. Mm. Does the code run without errors and return something? basic sanity check. Makes sense. Second, program safety. They block the use of certain Python packages stuff for file access, networking, system calls. Figure 8 lists them, keeps it sandboxed. Good. Don't want the AI emailing everyone. Definitely not. And third, determinism. They check if the program always gives the same output for the same input. Non-deterministic programs are filtered out because they make learning unreliable. 
Figure 13 shows how they check this. Those seem like really necessary guardrails. Okay, so they built this system, let it run. What happened? What were the big results? The results were, uh, frankly, quite stunning. The main finding, AZR, especially the coder variant, achieved state-of-the-art results on standard reasoning benchmarks. Both coding benchmarks like Human Evolve Plus and MBPP Plus 8 and math benchmarks like math and aim. State of the art without being trained on any human data for those specific benchmarks. Correct. It learned how to solve those kinds of problems purely through its self-generated curriculum. That's wild. How much better was it? On the coding benchmarks, AZR Coder 7B beat the previous best models by an average of 1.8 percentage points. And interestingly, it even edged out models specifically fine-tuned on human expert coding data by 0.3 points. Wow, so self-play beat supervised learning on its own turf, even if just slightly. That really challenges assumptions. It absolutely does. It Everyone. suggests this self-generation process can be incredibly effective, potentially even more so than learning from fixed human data sets in some cases. Did it matter which base model they started with? You mentioned a coder variant. Yes, they tested starting from a general base LLM versus one pre-trained heavily on code. The coder variant generally performed better after the absolute zero training, especially on coding tasks, but also did well on math. Table one shows this. So a good foundation helps, even if the learning method is different. Seems that way. A better starting point leads to a better end point, even with this self-play approach. Did they see any interesting reasoning strategies emerge? Like, how did the models actually solve these problems? Yeah, they observed different patterns. Uh, for abduction, finding the input, models often showed trial and error guessing inputs. For deduction, predicting output, sometimes they generated intermediate steps, almost like simulating the code execution, maybe like tracking values in dynamic programming. And for induction, writing the program. There, they saw systematic checking. The model would write some code and then seemingly test it against the provided input-output examples. That's fascinating. It's like developing genuine problem-solving techniques. What about this React-style planning in code induction? Right, that was particularly cool. Especially in the larger models, they saw comments appearing in the generated code that looked like planning steps. Like, okay, first I need to handle the base case, then iterate through the list. So thinking out loud in comments. Pretty much. Very similar to the React prompting technique used in other areas where models explicitly write out their reasoning steps. Figure 19 has an example. It seemed to emerge organically here. Incredible. But it wasn't all smooth sailing, right? There was an uh-oh moment. Ah, uh, yes. With the AZR Llama 3.18B model, they found it sometimes generated concerning chains of thought, as they put it. Figure 32 shows an example that raised safety flags. So while it got good at reasoning, it might have picked up some undesirable behaviors along the way. Potentially, yes. It's a strong reminder that as we develop these powerful self-learning methods, we absolutely need to build in robust safety alignment and monitoring. It's not automatic. A really critical point. What about the ablation studies? Did they confirm that all the different parts of absolute zero were necessary? They did. Removing task types, like getting rid of induction or abduction, significantly hurt math performance. It suggests each type contributes something unique to the overall reasoning ability. So you need that variety of challenges. Seems so. And the proposer design mattered too. When they stopped conditioning the proposer on past examples and just used a fixed prompt, performance dropped noticeably. Learning from its own history of task creation was important. So the model learning how to propose good tasks is key. Did the tasks it proposed get harder over time? Yes, they measured task complexity using things like complexify scores and Halstead metrics, mm. and diversity using AST, edit distance, and answer variety. Mm. All those metrics showed an upward trend during training. Figure 27 illustrates this. The system seems to implicitly push itself towards generating more complex and diverse problems as it learns. It bootstraps its own difficulty curve. In a way, yeah. Yeah. Interestingly, they noted the proposer sometimes generated a more complex, maybe less efficient code for deduction and abduction tasks, while the induction solver often found more elegant solutions for similar problems. A little bit of creative tension between the roles, and did it get better at the exact kinds of tasks it was training on, the in-distribution stuff? Yes. They check that too on benchmarks like Cruxival. As expected, performance on tasks like predicting outputs or inputs given code improves steadily throughout training. Figure 14 shows this climb. Makes sense. And the interaction between proposer and solver, any other quirks, like output length? Generally, the solver produced longer outputs than the proposer, which isn't too surprising since solving often takes more steps or code than just defining the problem. 
Induction tasks tended to have the longest solver outputs. So different tasks elicit different response lengths. Did they try any other ways to set this up that didn't work as well? Yeah, a few things. They tried composing programs to create a curriculum, but the model often found trivial shortcuts. They tried seeding with leak code problems, which boosted coding initially, but then plateaued and hurt math. Interesting. Anything else surprising? One thing was that removing comments and doc strings from the code actually hurt performance. Really? Why? Their hypothesis is that the comments might act as a hidden communication channel or a form of shared reasoning between the proposer generating the code and the solver potentially using it later, or even just for the model's own internal processing, like we saw with the React style comments. Fascinating. It highlights how complex these interactions can become. Okay, let's wrap up. What's the big picture here? The main significance of absolute zero. I think it's fundamentally about potentially breaking free from the human data bottleneck for reasoning tasks. It shows a path towards AI systems that can learn sophisticated skills like coding and math problem solving much more autonomously. And achieving soda in coding without specific human coding data is the big proof point. Absolutely, that's the result that really makes you sit up and take notice. It suggests self-generated experience can be incredibly powerful. And the future directions sound pretty ambitious, extending beyond code. Definitely. They talk about using web interaction, formal math systems, simulators, even the real world as environments for verifiable feedback, mm -hmm. applying it to embodied agents, multimodal reasoning. And tackling that safety aspect we discussed. Crucial. Integrating safety and alignment right into the self-learning process is going to be key as this paradigm develops. It really does feel like a potential shift, doesn't it? From models learning primarily from static human-provided data to learning from dynamic self-generated experience. That's a great way to frame it. The paper sort of hints at this moving towards models that don't just passively consume information, but actively shape their own learning journey. Which opens up, well, a lot of possibilities. If AI can define its own curriculum, tailored to its own learning needs, could it discover reasoning strategies or knowledge completely outside our current human frameworks? That's the really provocative long-term question, isn't it? What happens when AI truly starts learning on its own terms? It's a fascinating prospect. Definitely something to ponder. Well, that brings us to the end of this look at the Absolute Zero paper. A huge thanks for walking us through it. My pleasure. It's really exciting work. We hope you found this useful and thought-provoking. Thanks for tuning in to AI Paper Podcasts.